doing this morning? Good. Doing all right? How are you doing? You're blessed. Amen. See, that's, that's a great answer there. Anyone else blessed? Amen. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. We're all blessed. Blessed to have the, the Lord's love and His offer of forgiveness. And well, we've got uh, just a, a great opportunity this morning to sing some praises to the Lord, to, to take this beginning of the week and to kind of set our focus right, to look to the Lord, to look to His instruction and guidance in our life, to thank Him for His presence and His love in our lives. And so let's take a moment, let's pray, and let's commit our time to Him together. God, we are very blessed. We're blessed to have your love and your offer of forgiveness. We're blessed to have the promise of your presence with us no matter what we're going through in life, whether things are great or whether things are, are really difficult, to know that you never abandon us or forsake us. That's a blessing, Lord, that you are there to hold us in those most difficult times. You are the rock that we can cling to. God, we are blessed to enjoy fellowship with one another, that we can gather with other folks each week and know that we come with the same desire to worship you, the same attitude of love towards you, the same recognition of you as the God and King of our lives. And so God, we're truly blessed. We thank you for your many blessings in our lives. And we pray that this morning would be just another one of your blessings, that it would be a good chance to, to be encouraged and edified, to grow in our understanding of you and your word. God, that it would be a blessing to you as well as we seek to praise and exalt you as you alone deserve. So, Lord, we're thankful for this time. I'm thankful for each of these folks, and we just look forward to what you have for us in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let's stand together, and we're going to open with the hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be. what the Lord really wants from us is that we would offer our lives to Him, that in, that in seeking that relationship of salvation through faith in Christ, that we then would lay our lives at the foot of His cross and say, God, my life is now Yours. Take it and make it what You want it to be. Lead me to be what You would have me to be. God's the one who gives us that, that hope, living hope.
things that God would desire to see accomplished in this world, all of the things that God chooses to do in and through us really come back to Him. It's not us who accomplishes all of these things for God necessarily in our own strength. It's Christ at work in each one of us. And that's, that's really the, the subject of our next song here, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. Just 
follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home, and day by day. guys can head for the back doors there. Ah, there they go. Good lineup this morning. Look at that. Uh, just a couple of things to, uh, to point out to you guys by way of announcements. One, growth groups did start up this past week. And it is not too late. If you did not get signed up for a group and you would like to join us for that, growth groups meet uh, during the week in people's homes. We still have openings on both of the Tuesday night groups. They meet 7 to 8.30. And just gather together folks from the church, share in some encouraging time of fellowship, looking into uh, uh, this week we'll actually start the, the day into uh, the study portion of things, so uh, it's on the, uh, actually there's little sheets at the back of the table, that the questions that we use groups for the coming week, that come from what we talk about right now on Sunday, so to be able to dig in a little bit more to talking about this morning. So uh, talk to you afterwards and I will get you. So you can as well. A few other just kind of miscellaneous things. Um, the, the trustees have been taking bids for the parking lot. I want to kind of thank you guys for our parking lot fund. We've been to try and resurface the parking lot out there. Uh, I got to tell you, bids that are coming in are, are probably about half to a uh, full yearly annual budget for us. Still a ways off from being able to pull it off, but thank you for continuing to faithfully help to uh, put aside that money so that we can take care of the property God has given us. And then just a couple of quick reminders to a few of you, some of you are serving on our church, not working, uh, working towards nominating folks for the various boards and positions uh, that, that the needs of the church the coming year. So if you were on the nominating committee, uh, we follow up with nominees who were to be following up. We need to get those names uh, nailed down so we get everything put out there for the church. And trustees, uh, we have a, a meeting this coming Wednesday, but uh, more than just our regular meeting, it is our budget meeting to plan for coming. So I invite you guys to be praying for our trustees as they prayerfully come together and uh, seek those leading in planning a budget for next year. Uh, every budget for a church is a faith budget because we don't sell a product. It's, it's pretty much what, what God brings in through the 
giving of the folks of the church is what we have in terms of resources to do the ministry God's called us to do. So pray for our trustees as they work through that process this coming Wednesday night. Well, let's take a moment again and we'll pray and then we'll look into our study in James. God, in all of these things, again, we recognize that you are the one who has given us everything that we have. Truly, when we look at what we possess, uh, money, things, uh, our abilities and talents, really there's not one of them that we can honestly say didn't come from you. Yes, we do work to earn the money we, work, we earn, but the gifts and abilities we have to do that work, those, those are by your gifting. So the money really is by your gifting as well. And God, we do want to be good stewards of all you've given us individually and certainly as a church. So Lord, we just pray that you would continue to impress upon us your design and desire for us. Help us to see your calling in our lives. Help us to, to seek to honor you with obedience at every turn. And God, may we be quick to confess in those moments that we fall short. Thank you for your willingness to forgive us and the great love you've demonstrated towards us in Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, so James actually starts talking about money in James chapter 5 this morning. Money can buy a number of things that people enjoy, right? But what's the, the one thing that people always say money can't buy? Happiness, right? Money can't buy happiness. It can buy a, a of things that might make a person happy, but money can't buy happiness. Study after study has shown that the experiences of innumerable people confirm that money does not buy happiness. Money turns out to be one of the, one of the chief sources of conflict in any marriage. Money is right there at the top of the list, and money seems to be one of those things that has the potential to draw people in, you know, there's, there's a hankering for it in most of our lives, partially because we need it, but it sure would be nice to have a little more of it, right? That, that it has the potential to draw us in and can tempt us to make poor decisions. One CEO of a major company faced charges a few years ago for improperly using company funds. Records show that he purchased a $15,000 umbrella stand. Uh, an over $17,000 toiletries travel case when he was traveling. This, the company paid for a $6,000 shower curtain, a $2,200 waste basket, and plenty of other expensive things for his New York City apartment. The man had the company pay more than $1 million for his wife's 40th birthday, which they celebrated in Italy. Uh, the event was a, quite a... a I guess a gathering, uh, there were gladiators, there was an ice sculpture of Michelangelo's David, um, other expenses they found, $6,300 sewing basket, a $1,650 notebook, and nearly $6,000 for a set of sheets for his bed. And we, we look at things like that, we listen to things like that, and it, it's hard not to hear things like that and to think, man, what a waste. But what a waste. What, what frivolous things to spend so much money on. I mean, it's one thing to buy what you need, right? It's okay to buy some of the things you want, but stuff like that just seems like it goes overboard, doesn't it? I guess, where do we draw the line? Where does acceptable cross the line and become extravagant? I suppose for most of us, we usually put that line just beyond somewhere that we're currently living, don't we? I don't live extravagantly. You don't live extravagantly. That's, that's a little further. That's spending a little differently than I do. And most people, regardless of their financial situation, most people will not easily claim the title of rich. Wealth is a very powerful tool. It can allow a person to do some, some great things, and frankly, those can be either good or bad. But wealth is also a perilous thing because there's a lot of dangers that come with wealth. That's what James takes on in the fifth chapter of his letter. If you want to go ahead and open your Bibles and turn there with me, James chapter 5, we're just getting into the final chapter of the letter of James, very near the end of, of your Bibles there, uh, page 1092 or 3, I think, in the Pew Bibles. 
James, in the passage we're going to look at this morning, starts with a warning, and in fact, I think it's a, it's a good warning. I, I think wealth should come with a warning. In spite of all the comforts it may give, there is a, a misery that can overtake the wealthy if they are not looking for it, if they're not wise to it. From there, he goes on to sp- explain that wealth has a major weakness. The thing, all that a person can do with their and with their possessions, there is a fundamental problem with pseudo security can provide. And finally, James illustrates that wealth tempts us to do wrong. And it's not that he bashes on people for having money. As a matter of fact, he never says you shouldn't have money, shouldn't even be What he takes issue with is how people were handling it. They were handling their wealth wrong. So those are the three major things we're going to find in James 5. Wealth should come with a warning. Wealth has a major and Wealth can tempt us to do wrong. And after we consider all three of those things, I want to finish up by talking about what might live well with what we have. James chapter 5 he shows us, like I say, right from the start, I think he shows us that wealth should come with a warning. Contrary to James warns the wealthy among them, it's coming. Look at Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. That just seems odd, doesn't it? seems to make it clear these rich people who may, may not have even been a part of the church he was writing to. Perhaps there were some, but I think what he is talking to is some of the, the rich people in their society that look to their wealth more than any for their identity and their security. And what he makes clear here is that these rich people are going to experience a, a terrible ordeal. Matter of fact, they're probably living comfortably. If, if history has anything to indicate to us, these folks would have had lavish surroundings, plenty of food, plenty of money. In fact, people probably viewed their wealth as a way to avoid pain and suffering. If money had a happy about those things, a way to live lives of ease and comfort. What James tries to tell them in the first verse of chapter 5, ultimately, their wealth won't save them. Coming, it's the misery of judgment. Facing is not earthly suffering necessarily, though I, I suppose that earthly suffering, but what is coming is eternal. And so because of that, James urges them to weep and wail, something that I would have to imagine they probably weren't all that accustomed to. After all, their wealth likely allowed them to live comparatively carefree lives uh, compared to much of the rest of the first century world. But the judgment that was coming, that would remove all the laughter from their lives. And James' warning here is their wealth would not save them ultimately. So that's James' warning to the wealthy. And what he does next is to point out the futility of their wealth and how they've mishandled it. And all of that combines to show us that wealth has a major weakness. Wealth has a major weakness. We're not accustomed to thinking of wealth, are we? We're not accustomed to thinking of wealth as a weakness or a hindrance necessarily. Quite the opposite. Wealth can allow a person to seemingly do just whatever they want, have whatever they want. But with the next couple of verses, James highlights the major weakness of wealth, and in some, it's basically that it doesn't last. Look at verse 2 and into the beginning of verse 3. Your riches have rotted, and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your silver, your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. 
What a picture. James is basically saying that amassing wealth, amassing possessions is an exercise in futility. You see what the major weakness of wealth is here is what he says, it doesn't last. Wealth, whatever that looks like in our lives, is temporary at best. Clothes, obviously, eventually wear out. I doubt there's any of us here wearing the same thing even five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago. Clothes don't last. They wear out. Precious metals are precious because they generally don't tarnish and rust. And yet, he says, even, even precious metals will tarnish over time. Now, these things haven't happened yet. These wealthy folks that refers to were still enjoying the benefits of their earthly wealth and their place in life, but his point as he works his way through this letter and particularly in this section, his point is that unless they repent of their sin, the same as every one of us needs to do, unless they repent, their destiny is set. Forgiveness and salvation is found only in Christ, and apart from that, that Christless eternity is, is a place called hell. It's not just that the metals will touch, it's that their very lives will be consumed. These people had so much. Apparently, they had so much, they weren't even using it all. That's why it was going to waste. History tells us that the wealthy made up a very tiny percentage of the first century population. Uh, for the most part, in James' day, the average person owned a, a single set of clothing, perhaps a, a tunic and a cloak to wear over it when it was cold. That cloak would usually double as their blanket at night to keep them warm on cold nights. One of the hallmarks of wealth in the first century was that a person had multiple sets of clothing. And, and nicer clothing to boot. Jo James points out the futility of that level of wealth, saying that their garments had decayed, specifically because they weren't being used. You have so many nice clothes that you're not even using them all, and the dogs are getting to them. It was happening with their gold and silver. It was tarnishing for lack of use. These Wealthy people had so much money that it just wasn't even being used. It just sat around gathering rust, gathering rust, if it could. Again, for the most part, the average person in James' day, most people kind of lived hand to mouth. The money they earned was turned right around into meals and immediate needs for the family. The wealthy people in James' day probably felt that their wealth, their Possessions gave them a certain level of purity. They had money, they had land, they had food, they had clothes in excess. So what more could they possibly need? But as James has already warned them, they should be weeping and howling in misery because, well, because misery is coming. The weakness of wealth is that it just doesn't last. The same business that can make a person rich today collapse tomorrow and, and put them into an incredible amount of debt. More than that, though, the truth is you can't take it with you. All of this wealth that James is referring to, it's just in the here and now. That doesn't go with us across the threshold of eternity and I think what James is trying to indicate to these folks here is, look, all the money in the world is not going to save you from God's judgment. God doesn't take American Express to pay off the debt of your sin. That's the major weakness of wealth. It does not save you. It cannot save you. And with the rest of the passage then, James shows us that wealth can tempt us to do wrong. There's four things in the next few verses here that James accuses the wealthy of doing. Four crimes, I guess you could say, that will be judged 
by God over which they should weep and wail. It reads to me like an inventory of selfishness, but I believe if we're honest, it's something that we can all be tempted to fall into. I think especially in our Western culture, we're used to a certain standard of living, maybe a certain level of excess. The four things that I see James accusing the wealthy of here, and we'll dig into them one at a time, but first, he accuses them of hoarding their wealth. Secondly, of defrauding other people. Thirdly, of just living self-indulgent lives. And then finally, of effectively murdering those that were poorer than them. I want to take them one at a time because I want us to feel the weight of James' accusations. The first crime of selfishness that James lists for us here is hoarding wealth. We've already seen a bit of that in verses 2 and 3. We'll look at them again. Your riches have rotted, your garments have become moth-eaten, your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Wealth can tempt us to do wrong. We've already seen that these wealthy people had so much that it was going to waste. It was a a witness of their greed and selfishness. They had far more than they could ever use. At the end of that passage, he says that you've stored up your treasure here in the last days. You know, Christ had some very clear things to say about money during His ministry on earth and what He made clear, the bottom line that He made clear in Matthew 16, 26, is what He said that what good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Nothing. And yet these people had amassed all of this, they had hoarded all of this wealth as though it was going to somehow offer them more than it could. To make matters worse, there were people all around them who were on the brink of starvation whose need was enormous, but it would seem that none of that mattered to them. They had theirs, they had what they needed, had what they wanted, they were comfortable, so the need of theirs was not the problem. Reminds me of an animated Disney film from a number of years ago, Emperor's New Groove. If you remember that one, it was a number of years ago. In, in the Emperor's New Groove, very early on in the movie, the main antagonist, the, the bad, well, not a bad guy, bad gal, uh, the bad gal, who is enjoying the luxury of the palace, is rendering judgments on peasants that come before her, and, and she interrupts one that is, is standing before her to, to, you know, request assistance, and she kind of waves him off, and it's, it's no concern of mine whether your family has, was it again? He says, um, food? She says, ha, thought of that before you became peasants. Take him away. That seems to be the attitude that these people had. I've got mine. You don't have yours? That's your problem. I guess you should work hard. Maybe you should have made better financial decisions. No concern of mine whether your family has, what was it in? Whatever. That's your problem. James tells the wealthy that they've hoarded their wealth in the last days. The New Testament regards the entire time between Christ's first appearing and, and death and ascension between that time and His second coming. That's the last days. We are in the last days. Because Christ can return at any point. And so what have these wealthy people done? They've kept it all to themselves. Instead of seeking to use some of what they had to help others or or seeking what God might have them do with it, they've let it go to waste by just sitting on it. But that's just the first of the wrongs they've committed. The next crime is that they have defrauded others. They have extorted and cheated 
the very people who were working for them. Look at verse 4. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. The people who worked for the rich were at the opposite end of the financial spectrum. They didn't have it all. They were poor peasants. They, typically, they were day laborers who got paid at the end of each working day, their day's wages. Frequently, they Families lived kind of right on the verge of starvation. They were just getting by. Today's wages bought tomorrow's food. And if a worker did not receive his wages, then guess what? The whole family was going hungry tomorrow. Furthermore, if the landowner refused to pay, hoarded the wages, or withheld the wages until the end of the harvest, these workers had little recourse. There was really no one they could go to for help, because complaining of the job entirely, and they certainly couldn't afford to hire a lawyer or something. The only recourse these poor people had was to call out to God. Here James calls him the Lord of Sabaoth, which means the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the armies of heaven, if you will. The phrase conjures up the image of God being prepared to go to war against the wealthy to defend his oppressed poor. The thing is, though, they had no excuse for post-dating the check. It wasn't that they didn't have the money and, and had to, well, you need to wait two weeks till I have enough money to be able to pay you. It wasn't that at all. They were wealthy. They had it. They were just hoarding it. James paints a really graphic picture here. Stolen are depicted as cries against the wealthy. The, the cries of the work had reached the ears of heaven. And I think that should make wealthy shudder at what or, or rather who was prepared to come for their crime. But wait, there's more. The third thing James accuses the wealthy of Doing wrong focuses on their lavish lifestyles. Live indulgent lives. Verse 5 says, You have lived luxuriously on earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. The rich here are pictured just living in the lap of luxury. Self-indulgence. They haven't refused themselves any pleasure. They have given themselves anything and everything their heart desired. James' point is that all of these things are earthbound things. Yeah, you have lived luxuriously on the earth for this time that God has given you under the sun, the, the 70, 80, 90 years. You've lived in luxury. That reward is in the here and now. But there is a judgment that is coming later, and that judgment determines how you are going to live for eternity. I know I've probably mentioned this before. Math, you remember fractions, right? Okay. Here's on the top of the on the bottom. Seventy eighty years against infinity, that's a pretty small fraction. The balance is where we end the eternity. He says, okay, you, you've spent that thing in history, but you have received all the comfort 
that you're going to have if, if that's what your focus is. In the next life, you're not going to experience anything but And in many ways, they will arrive at the judgment content, but condemned. It seems very graphically shows that these rich folks that he's referring to here are on the verge of such judgment. On the very day that judgment was to come, he said, because you don't know when it's coming, you have, you have basically been fattening yourselves up like a cow that's headed to slaughter. You've just been living large without any thought of what's coming. And with that, James shows that a life of luxury and self-indulgence, he says, look, essentially that's, that's a worthless life if that's all you're focused on. When Christ returns to take His people to heaven, you know what? Money won't mean much. We should spend our time accumulating treasures that will be worthwhile in God's eternal kingdom. And money itself is not the problem. All people, Christian, James and his readers, all people need money to live. It's just the way life works. We need money to support our families. It's not money that's the root of all evil. It's the love of money that is the root of all sorts of evil. It causes some to oppress others in order to get more. And I think this is a, a reasonable warning to, to everyone, to all Christians, that if we're tempted to adopt a, a worldly standard of trying to, you know, get ahead and, and keep up with the Joneses, as it were, if we're tempted to kind of fall into that, seeking that standard rather than God's standard, I think James' warning is, is a valid warning for us. His final accusation in these verses has to do with how the rich have effectively murdered the innocent. Look at verse 6. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. Here we see the wealthy basically usurping God's role as judge. Because of their status, they feel they have the right to condemn whoever they choose. What James is confronting here is a mindset that treats other people however it wants without regard for their dignity. And, and ultimately disregards the very lives of those people who have been mistreated. They're the riffraff, the peons, the, 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 the people I don't need to concern myself with. And we see that attitude, don't we, of, of treating others with disrespect as if they don't matter. How many times have we seen in person or videos online of somebody running down a, a, a sales clerk at a business or something who had absolutely nothing to do with whatever the problem is, but they just lay into this person like, like there's no tomorrow. James is confronting that sort of a mindset. The murder that he speaks of here, I, I can see it being both active and, and passive. I, I don't doubt that inconvenient people may have actually been done away with by putting them to death. Far too many instances of that sort of thing in history of wealthy people just eliminating people that were inconvenient to them. But even more likely was that the poor couldn't pay their debts. And so what would happen? Well, they would get thrown into debtor's prison until they would be able to repay or they were forced to sell all of their possessions and without any means of support, without any opportunity to work off their debts, these poor people and their families probably frequently died of starvation because they couldn't provide for themselves anymore. Now, God also considered that sort of intentional neglect. He's like, that's, that's murder. These oppressed people did not resist the wealthy because they weren't in any position to be able to do so. They didn't have any resources to be able to resist. And again, their only recourse was to call out to God against their rich oppressors. What the wealthy need to under, needed to understand here was that God takes it personally. 
when we treat other people like garbage. I think we need to hear that because we all have that potential to, you know, ah, that, that person had it coming. God takes it personal when we treat other people like garbage. Like, like they don't even deserve our attention as they die. So that, that's what the wealthy did wrong. They hoarded their wealth. They defrauded others. They lived extremely self-indulgent lives. They effectively murdered the innocent. And the fact is, is that wealth can tempt us to do wrong. If it's not those wrongs specifically, it can tempt us to do other things wrong. So how can we make sure that we aren't poised to fall under the same judgment that James is warning the wealthy of here in chapter 5? How can we avoid the same temptations? I think the answer is to choose to live well with what you have. Choose to live well with what the Lord has given you. We need to be good stewards of everything God has given us. We need to live well with what we have. I would sum things up this way in light of James' warning that we should prayerfully consider how to best use what God has given us. I think if we were to take this and say, okay, so what, what do I do with James 5, 1 through 6? Well, prayerfully consider how to best use what God has given you. Everything that we have has been graciously given to us by God. He's our provider in all things. So if we're going to honor Him with obedience, we need to ask Him to help us use what He's given us in the way He wants us to use it, according to His design. There's three things that I would like to talk about as we consider living well with what we have. First, I want us to briefly consider what God has to say about money. Secondly, we'll consider the differences between hoarding and saving. And then thirdly, we'll highlight some of the marks of self-indulgence so that we can avoid living like the people James was writing about. So first, it has a lot to say about money. There are so many verses in Scripture that talk about money, either or way. I toyed with the idea of putting on the screen of uh, all of these different things that God has to say about money and the Scripture associated with each one, but we'd probably be here till next Sunday because there are just so many things that God has to say. God addresses the dangers of money. He gives advice about money. He encourages a correct perspective on money. He even speaks directly to employers in His Word. If we were to only consider what God has to say through James in our passage this morning. We would still see that the dangers of money include the fact that we can often end up ignoring God when we have so much. And we certainly can end up ignoring others. Ultimately, we might find ourselves facing God's judgment for looking to our, our wealth, our possessions, our stuff for more of our sense of security than God's offer of forgiveness and salvation. Now, let me insert a word here about judgment in the New Testament. Judgment is an extremely complex thing in Scripture, not, not complex and hard to understand, complex in that it's, it's kind of multifaceted, I guess I'd say. So, you have uh, chastening judgment, which a lot with the Lord when God brings judgment on people, when God uh, does that, a, a lot of times it's with an eye towards restoration. God allows consequences in our lives as a result of our sin, not just out of a desire to punish us, but out of a desire to draw us back to Himself in repentance, that we would recognize, did that wrong, God? I need to, I need to turn away from that. I need to ask Your forgiveness. I need to do it right. So that's, that's one sort of judgment that God does meet out. It's, it's that judgment with an eye towards repentance, towards restoration. 
But then there's also the judgment which results in separation from God and eternal destruction. And that, that certainly is the judgment that, that includes promise of a Christless eternity in hell, to be ultimately and eternally separated from God's goodness and His love. And it, it's not entirely clear which of, let's say, those two forms of judgment that James has in mind in chapter 5. He could be talking about eternal judgment. He could be talking about God trying to turn somebody around with judgment and draw them back to Himself. I, I don't know that we need to really understand which one of those it is 100% because neither one is something we should desire to experience. So if we're to prayerfully consider how to best use what God has given us, we need to know what God has to say about mine. And that's a worthy study. You know, you can, you can do a, a lot of studying and find a lot of what God has to say in His Word to us because He addresses it extensively. Another help to us in the pitfalls that James understand there is a difference between saving. And, and the difference may be, may be nuanced. James' warning here is, is certainly not against saving money. What he's against is that selfish hoarding that affects not only that person, but everyone else in that person's life. There's dangers in having that kind of a hoarding mindset when it comes to health. One is because it, it tempts us to, it, it fosters in us a, a sense of earthly security and maybe even independence from God. I don't have to pray that God would help me figure out how to do this. I've got everything I need. I can do it myself. It can promote a sense of superiority over others just by virtue of what I have. It assumes that what a person gains is only for their own benefit, that it's mine. It's irresponsible indulgence just for today. I'm just living according to my whims, and it promotes, I think, impulsive spending decisions. If I've got so much that I can buy whatever I want, I'll buy whatever I want without giving it too much thought because I can by contrast, God calls us to be good stewards, and saving is a part of that. I think there are wonderful benefits as we choose to save and plan because, one, it demonstrates good stewardship of the resources God has provided. I think it makes us able to respond to the needs of others more immediately because I have something set aside. This person's in need. I actually have something I can help them with. It assumes that God provides for people through what He's already given us. Yeah, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills and can meet any need, but you know how He often meets needs? It's through all of us. We become the Lord's loving arms to others. Saving is certainly responsible preparation for tomorrow. It promotes wise spending decisions less likely to be impulsive if I know I'm trying to carefully save. Ultimately, though, saving must keep in mind that what is saved still belongs to God, and it's at His disposal. If God says, you know what, you need to help this person right now, then we need to be willing to say, you know what, God, it's your money. If you call me to do it, I'll do it. Finally, let's consider some of the marks of self-indulgence because I don't think that any one of us would want to be in the category of people that James is addressing here. When our lives begin to display any of these characteristics, I think we, we are practicing self-indulgence and we probably need to repent of that. When we assume that our wealth should always be used to meet our needs first, it's mine, it's for me to enjoy without any thought of anyone else, we're, we're stepping into dangerous territory then. When we visualize wealth as protection, insulation between us and the rest of the world, that's, that's not a healthy attitude. That's a, that's a self-indulgent attitude. When we waste or destroy or discard something that is perfectly useful to someone else just because, well, I don't need it anymore. 
when we are smug or prideful at the difference between what we have and what someone else has, that's a self-indulgent attitude. When we invest in things purely for status without actually considering their usefulness, it's all about image at that point, isn't it? Self-indulgence is a sin to be avoided. We need to remember that everything that we have, whatever we have, comes from God and, and is given much more than just our ease or our satisfaction. So, let's, let's wrap things up. James has provided a warning to the wealthy here in the beginning of chapter 5. He's shown us wealth's major weakness, that wealth can tempt us to do wrong. And, and we've taken the time to consider how we might choose to live well with what we have. But what we've learned is that in light of James' warning, we should prayerfully consider how to best use what God has given us, everything God has given us. Here's the hardest part. We, uh, probably every one of us in this room, we would absolutely fit the definition of rich in James' day. Not that we're necessarily doing any or, or all of the things that James accused the rich of here, but there's, there's the possibility, there's the, the danger of it. We can disregard those who are poor and needy in the world. We can take time to only please ourselves with what we have, not think of others. We can idolize the, the people in our world who have more than we do, the rich. We can kind of aspire to be like them, to have the things that they have, to, to set our goal to be like them. That's what our culture does. We can spend a lot of our lives pursuing luxury, pursuing wanton, self-indulgent pleasures instead of pursuing what God would have for us to do with what He's given us. So I guess for, for me, for us, maybe the caution is let's, let's be careful we're not trying to imitate the world in this way. There's just enough of that out there. Let's, let's step out and live lives that glorify God, that honor Him. And, and maybe, maybe you don't fall into the category of the people that James is talking about here. Again, probably just by virtue of all that we have, we would have been comparatively rich in James' day. That doesn't mean we, we have to live like the rich people that James is talking about here. Each of us, though, should take the time to prayerfully consider if we're living rightly before God in terms of our wealth. With what I have, God, however much or however little it may be, am I using it the way you would want me to use it? And that, that should be our prayer then. We should prayerfully consider, God, how can I best use what you've given me? Let's pray and ask for His help in that right now. God, we do want to be good stewards of what You've given us. We want to be people that, that are known for our love of You and, and our obedience to You. God, You have given us so very much. Uh, really, even... Comparing ourselves not just to people in the first century of James' day, even comparing ourselves to a, a significant portion of the rest of the modern world, we are comparatively wealthy. But God, I pray that we wouldn't allow that to be something that goes to our heads, I guess. It wouldn't be about what we have and what we can do. The, the attitude would be much more what you've given us and what you would have us do with it. Help us, Lord, to prayerfully consider how we can use everything that you've given us in the best way that you call us to. God, we do thank you for your provision. I thank you for what you have given us. And Lord, just help us to treat it the way you want us to treat it, to love you first and foremost and seek your direction in all of it. We ask this help in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll stand together and close out our time with a, a nice short song here. My Jesus, I love thee.
go out in the strength of the Lord. Thank him for the provisions he's given you. Commit them along with your very life to the Lord and seek his leading. And trust that he'll give it to you. God bless you guys.